So first of all, I uh, would like to thank Benoit and Patricia for inviting me uh, here to this extremely intimidating place. So I did all possible to keep you interested. I'm sort of uh, speaking here as a Sunday preacher. It's kind of hard before the lunchbox and before Mont Blanc. Uh, so I did all possible, as I said. I brought the bad weather. I trained. So I wanted to turn you into a captive audience. So uh, at least I have two takes on that. Uh, whatever I cannot finish uh, today, there will be tomorrow night uh, where I'll put you in a hypnotic state so you'll stay here overnight. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm very excited to talk about uh, uh, ultra short uh, pulse technologies, um, but I really had to discipline myself sort of to um, uh, uh, deliver a message. And uh, the main message which I will try uh, delivering here is uh, that uh, uh, there's no winner. So uh, if you speak about laser amplification or parametric amplification, they simply have to find their own ecological niches. And uh, so before this message got watered down by the details, um, I just want to say that uh, in my opinion, the uh, uh, OPCPA technology that will be sort of the key uh, piece of technology that I will be reviewing uh, can exist in two niches. One niche is uh, uh, high energy, low rep rate uh, uh, systems. And another one, systems where simply lasers don't deliver the required uh, transitions simply because of the wavelength tunability, uh, OPA the wins hands down. And um, um, unfortunately, it's not possible to talk about a task like this uh, in a very abstract way, because it should always be uh, linked to a, a particular demand of a particular application of a particular technology. So speaking about that generically is uh, pretty difficult. And another problem is that the devil is in the details. So if you skip the details, then the whole justification sort of uh, uh, becomes obscure. So those are my predicaments. Uh, uh, let's see how well I can manage to deliver the, man the message across. Uh, I would appreciate if uh, the lecture could be slightly more interactive. So I would welcome interruptions during the lecture because that could uh, help me sort of uh, change the emphasis a little bit. So uh, is that allowed? They say not allowed. <laughs> But uh, okay, okay. So, so then, 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 then I'll have, then I'll need to go for it. For, I'll need to go for an educated guess. And if I notice that uh, uh, half of the audience uh, we'll sort of, uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, dozing down or something like that, I'll start either screaming or uh, I'll start asking provocative uh, questions. Okay, and. Uh, um, I need to be one of those apologists for um, uh, ultra short pulse uh, technology. Um, so uh, it's a compound problem. So when the laser started, everybody said it's a solution waiting for the problem. So when you talk about ultra fast lasers, it, it becomes even worse because this is a, a small subsegment uh, of uh, uh, sort of the total laser industry, the total laser research field. And it's been around for more than 30 years. And uh, it's pretty hard sort of still uh, to justify ultra short pulse industry. So that's exactly the point which I wanted to start from. And uh, uh, the beginning will be slightly uh, unusual. Uh, I'll just uh, show you how ultra fast pulse technology is introduced uh, to uh, sort of lay people. Uh, I'll show you a few pages from um, an industrial digest. So basically that's how it's sold to the customers. And I thought uh, a few uh, people here would be sufficiently removed uh, from uh, ultra fast technology so to, to have an unbiased look at it. So they would really appreciate it as potential customers. And also since uh, nearly everybody here is a PhD student, potentially considering a career either in science or technology, maybe it's good to see what the industry opportunities are. So I'll keep this segment extremely short, but uh, uh, I hope that to some of you it could be a little bit of an eye-opener. 
Okay, so uh, what's the proposal? Um, as I said, I will mainly talk uh, about uh, um, short pulse uh, uh, optical parametric amplification. So before we get there, I sort of want to make distinctions uh, uh, when we need it. So to do that, I would need to introduce conditions when we can get or when we can actually engineer broadband, broad, broadband phase matching. So that's to produce uh, short pulses. Uh, I will also talk about uh, conditions, uh, what uh, the simple phase relationship in a wave mixing um, allows us to do with the combination of the waves. Uh, so that will be about beam combining, that will be about uh, uh, coherent waveform uh, synthesis, and a little bit about carry envelope phase stabilization, just to indicate that those uh, topics are available and all of them come uh, from the uh, simple uh, phase uh, conjugation uh, uh, relationship, yes. So that's the practical uh, use of uh, uh, phase conjugation. Then I will mention the idea of a short pulse uh, amplifier. So I had to self-discipline uh, to remove most of the arguments from the part of the laser, but I cannot skip them completely because uh, then it wouldn't be uh, clear uh, what the restrictions of the technology are. So the key message here is that uh, when you develop an OPA and you say that the OPA will solve your problems, actually you're kind of cheating because you're putting all the problems on the side of the laser. So you can deliver a beautiful story about how the OPA saves the day and in the end it will simply amount to taking the problem out of one pocket and sticking it in the uh, pocket, uh, sort of making it the headache of the laser developer. And uh, uh, then uh, we will look uh, into the problems of uh, OPCPA itself. Uh, I will also uh, mention um, sort of uh, an intermarriage of the two techniques on the way. And uh, uh, what I'm leaving uh, for tomorrow's lecture, um, I want to talk about uh, 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 wave synthesis uh, using OPAs and uh, particularly long wave drivers, because that's, as already mentioned, uh, that's where OPA wins uh, hands down because we have no alternatives here uh, with the laser. Okay, so um, uh, the last um, sort of uh, technical warning, a few slides uh, that I'm presenting here, they're either extremely verbose or too complicated to explain, and this is done more or less intentionally because uh, you will have the PDF files and you simply can uh, refer uh, back to that um, after the lecture. So I think it's uh, uh, useful to have those slides, uh, but I will s uh, spend the m sort of the minimal amount of time uh, talking about them. So this is one of those slides which is uh, rather complicated because it uh, uh, presents um, some sort of uh, uh, classification of where we stand with the technology from the point of view of uh, uh, potential scientific, industrial, and biomedical applications. Of course, it's extremely biased, it's uh, incomplete, and uh, um, I still think it's useful. So it's my personal view of uh, uh, what we can do. Um, so uh, uh, the uh, uh, it's drawn that way, uh, this way. Um, this is the energy uh, scale of the pulses on the logarithmic scale, uh, starting from picojoules and going to multijoules. And uh, those are the um, basic elements of uh, technology. Um, so uh, we need to start with a uh, mode locked oscillator. So it's either a fiber. Uh, mode locked oscillator or solid state uh, mode locked oscillator. So the solid state oscillators currently already uh, produce energies into the uh, microjoules, so that's substantial. And for many applications of parametric conversions, uh, con conversion then uh, can be used uh, to produce even nanojoule pulses. Um, so uh, then we need to think about either frequency conversion or um, uh, further amplification and maybe then frequency conversion. Um, so uh, oscillators are used as a seed 
for either solid state uh, uh, master oscillator power amplifiers or uh, fiber amplifiers. So the predominant um, ultra-fast amplifier nowadays is a turbine-built uh, uh, fiber amplifier. Um, so the oscillators directly can be used to uh, pump, uh, synchronously pump the OPOs, uh, so both fiber and uh, solid state. And um, amplified systems can be used on their own or they can be used for uh, down converting the uh, optical frequency, so with an energy loss, of course, and uh, 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 that's the final uh, product that goes into the application. So obviously we would do that uh, for a reason, and the reason could be, for example, to obtain a shorter pulse with a higher peak intensity at the expense of the overall loss of uh, the pulse energy, or it could be because we require a particular wavelength. So uh, yesterday uh, in Paul Corcom's talk, you saw examples of such, an, um, of such cases where people had to use OPA converted pulses to match uh, the band gap of the uh, materials that they study. Now the lower part would take hours to uh, explain. So this is a catalog of uh, um, potential applications, as I said. So on the high energy side, you can do relativistic physics and uh, uh, nuclear fusion. So that has already been uh, demonstrated with uh, uh, femtosecond lasers. There's a very big potential segment for uh, XUV lithography. So uh, doesn't have to be necessarily done with femtosecond pulses, but uh, there's also a big promise there. So, um, and it's not only for um, actually realizing that uh, 13 nanometer lithography process that was promised to everybody to go online back in 2014, and so far that hasn't happened. But it's also to do further imaging of what you produce by this lithography because you need even shorter uh, wavelengths. And that's where uh, coherent and incoherent uh, plasma, laser plasma driven X-ray sources uh, become uh, important. Um, so also uh, laser pulses are excellent uh, particle accelerators. Um, so there are very traditional uses, uh, nonlinear spectroscopy, uh, quite a big uh, segment of the market. Um, uh, for more than 10 years, there's another segment development, developing its uh, terahertz absorption spectroscopy based on uh, simple um, uh, mode-locked oscillators as a uh, pump source. Uh, so very, very big chunk is uh, imaging using two-photon microscopy. Um, that, that idea sort of matured over almost 20 years, and now it went mainstream because uh, medical doctors can buy turnkey uh, uh, femtosecond lasers. And a huge chunk is uh, micromachining. So I'll just uh, quickly flash a few examples at you to keep you interested, and surgery. So uh, this is... Uh, uh, really um, ballooning the, the area. Okay, so this is the promised uh, excerpt from uh, how ultra-short pulse technology is uh, uh, marketed to uh, lay people. Uh, so very cute statement says that ultra-fast refers to the subformal regime. So the first statement that they give you is actually from the materials processing uh, point of view. And later they uh, link it to sophisticated and expensive uh, compression technique and the use of uh, uh, mode law lasers. So the quintessential statement here that they make it sound as unattractive as possible. And uh, if you look at the uh, uh, market uh, uh, figures, that's how the uh, industrial laser uh, revenue market grew. So this is from last year's um, 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 sort of classified report. It's not, okay, it's not classified, it's just delivered to the members who subscribe and they have to be uh, uh, industry uh, uh, enterprises. Um, so you see that the total uh, revenue by 2013 uh, uh, was uh, going in, in the billion, so in around two billion US dollars range. But the ultra-fast lasers uh, amounted to something like just 5% of that. 
So it's, it's still an appreciable uh, figure, uh, but uh, uh, it's just 5%. And most of that is from uh, uh, metal processing. Another sub-segment is uh, uh, dicing uh, uh, and uh, cutting of uh, uh, glasses. Um, actually, what you can also see here is a small dip, which was related to the uh, financial uh, crisis 2009 and it has recovered uh, nicely. So uh, also uh, you see that uh, still uh, 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 fiber lasers uh, uh, are winning overall in the overall uh, uh, market. But for instance, for microscopic uh, uh, microprocessing uh, market, solid state lasers are still winning and that's because they can deliver a better uh, pulse fidelity even though that uh, the stability of those lasers is probably inferior. So um, uh, this is the projected growth of uh, diode-pumped uh, uh, solid-state lasers uh, uh, for uh, spectroscopy. Uh, so you see that uh, uh, the uh, uh, figures are, uh, well, uh, quite interesting. Uh, so the overall, there is a, a projected uh, growth and once again, the solid state uh, uh, laser technology is still uh, doing better than the fiber-based technology. Um, that's the last uh, sort of statistics data uh, sheet. Uh, I uh, really find it remarkable. Um, and uh, it's also relevant to probably everyone here because uh, um, at least once in our lifetimes, we'll need to do something about our eyes and uh, they can be spoiled in uh, many different ways. So uh, now it's many processes. It's not only cataract surgery, it's uh, presbyopia and others that can be uh, cured uh, directly by applying uh, femtosecond lasers. So for a long time, uh, uh, people sort of looked at this symbiotic technique using a femtosecond laser to open up the flap and then an excimer laser to uh, a blade. So now, uh, thanks to the rise of uh, mature uh, ethorbium lasers, like on the order of 200 femtoseconds, and thanks to nonlinear optics that allows you to convert the frequency to the fifth harmonic, you can do it uh, uh, with one single device um, and uh, avoid the use of a toxic laser like the excimer laser. And uh, um, that already produces a steady growth. Um, in the uh, eye surgery market. Um, and I was told that the growth would have been exponential if uh, insurance companies would have, start, uh, would have started covering the expenses of uh, LASIK. So uh, apparently the moment they do it, uh, the, the curve will uh, go up exponentially. Okay, so uh, what about those uh, regimes? Uh, uh, very, very briefly, uh, so the advantage of uh, Ultra short pulses, as it's always marketed, that uh, they can have non thermal material removal. I don't know if you can see it clearly because the lights are quite bright. Um, so, this is done with uh, 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 short uh, femtosecond pulse. I don't know. Here are the labels. So, this is five femtoseconds, this is uh, five picoseconds. And this is done in uh, uh, fused silica, and this is done in metal. Uh, but the femtosecond pulses, picosecond pulses. And you see that uh, uh, as soon we start, as we start going uh, thermal, uh, there is a, a melt uh, appearing uh, uh, around the uh, laser drilled hole. So for metals, uh, um, it's uh, interesting that for pulses, essentially shorter than a uh, picosecond, uh, uh, we uh, don't see um, any significant uh, melt figures. So the electron temperature uh, rises rapidly. The electrons can follow uh, the field uh, much faster, but the overall temperature uh, remains low. So this is an exponential uh, logarithmic uh, uh, time scale. So for uh, uh, dielectrics uh, processing, uh, uh, people um, uh, differentiate between uh, several different uh, regimes. Uh, so uh, irreversible damage on the right and uh, uh, more or less waveguide uh, writing regime on the left. So I will not go deeper into that. 
um, just uh, um, sort of uh, for uh, general enjoyment, uh, I put a few representative slides uh, uh, on how the picosecond uh, laser cutting uh, difference from uh, femtosecond laser cutting. So this is done in uh, metals. And uh, you see that uh, even though the quality is uh, quite good, actually, I don't know if you can see it. I hope you can see it. Otherwise, you will need to study the handouts later. Um, so, but the quality is still inferior as compared to uh, femtosecond lasers. So this is uh, the same uh, work we've shown uh, from uh, the entrance and the exit side. So uh, pay attention that the uh, velocity of processing uh, uh, is very different. So once we switch from uh, picosecond to femtosecond, it uh, uh, draws very, very substantially. And uh, the quality of the cut is uh, uh, hugely improved. And, uh, as I was showing in those market slides, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a huge uh, source of revenue because uh, people make stencils out of that, which are used for uh, bypass uh, surgeries and to keep the arteries open. Uh, and uh, they're used for uh, nozzle injection uh, fuels and uh, such like. So those are um, uh, examples of uh, uh, standard uh, uh, micromachining. Um, and uh, uh, one thing that really stimulates the growth of the industry is now the cutting of uh, uh, Gorilla glasses. So everybody has a phone. And uh, in most cases, it's uh, uh, cut by a femtosecond laser. And there are uh, very tricky applications going down to semiconductor cutting where actually uh, even a uh, sub picosecond and a few hundred femtosecond pulse duration already makes a difference. So we're down to those uh, differences. So both materials here uh, is the same material is cut with uh, uh, sub picosecond pulses and optimized femtosecond pulses. And for semiconductors, it's very critical to uh, reduce uh, heat deposition. Okay, so, um, so uh, one more slide on uh, what we can do exclusively with femtoseconds. Um, because of the plasma on the uh, uh, surface of uh, uh, dielectrics, we can have uh, uh, sub uh, nanometer, sub wavelengths uh, nanoripples. So the process is not fully understand, but uh, I'm bringing it up because it's exclusive to femtoseconds. You cannot do it with picoseconds. And there are huge promises uh, like uh, for creating a lab on chip uh, through uh, laser assisted uh, etching techniques. Uh, so you uh, do micro uh, processing with the laser, then you etch away the channel, and then you create a, uh, a microfluidics uh, chip like a chromatography column uh, that uh, could be fixed to the body. And uh, uh, people who do that, they always motivated the following way. So uh, people want to monitor uh, animal diseases like uh, bird flu, and uh, they want to attach a chip to every chicken. And uh, uh, they say, the problem is that the chip has to be less expensive than the chicken. So it probably will take some more time before we get there. Okay, and uh, uh, those are the illustrations of the three regimes of the dielectric. Uh, damage, uh, but I guess I need to speed up a little bit. Um, so there are two classic examples of uh, two photon um, uh, applications. So one of them is uh, the two photon microscopy, as, already, as I already mentioned. Nowadays, it's mainstream. You just buy a ready uh, two photon microscope, for instance, from uh, Carl Zeiss. And uh, uh, the beauty is that uh, your spatial resolution in the two, two photon absorption regime is extremely enhanced as compared to a single photon fluorescence. And also, uh, uh, this has been used in uh, uh, two photon um, polymerization uh, very successfully. So nowadays, you have a company doing two photon polymerization uh, basically uh, springing up like every month. And the, their demands are very modest. Uh, they're happy with just uh, mode lock lasers. So this field is moving in a very interesting direction. So now they have started doing 
wavelength selection of uh, two photon absorption to uh, uh, induce polymerization. So now they have, now they can have layers consistent of uh, polymers with different rigidity, and uh, they're hoping to break into the uh, uh, biomedical applications market. Okay, so uh, the principle of the uh, two photon enhancement is obvious; it's the same as in uh, two photon microscopy. So I already said uh, quite a few words about uh, uh, ophthalmology. So now there is just, uh, 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 it's more than uh, cataract surgery. Uh, one can talk about that uh, endlessly. Uh, so the latest uh, patents, uh, they completely rely on the use of the femtosecond laser only. So far they can only treat uh, uh, my, uh, myopic cases because uh, the uh, curvatures that you need to produced by two photon damage uh, can only be uh, convex, they cannot be concave. But uh, this is really uh, a blossom in market and uh, uh, as I said, so it's especially supported by the latest patents that uh, rely completely on uh, one micron uh, femtosecond laser. Okay, so of course the uh, uh, laser applications field is extremely wide and uh, broad, so you see that Anywhere we go with the potential intensity, we'll find uh, an application. So usually we are in this uh, modest uh, uh, range. Um, so uh, I will later mention in the second part of my talk, uh, uh, K-alpha uh, radiation uh, production. Um, and that would be like the, the highest intensity application I will talk about. So, uh, as I mentioned, I cannot really spend time commenting on, uh, on, the, on those slides in more detail. So please uh, 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 go back to the references. So I tried referencing the slides as much as I could. So we are in Europe. The biggest projects uh, in Europe uh, uh, are, uh, thanks to Gerard Moreau and uh, his initiative, are um, extreme light infrastructure has been divided into uh, uh, several pillars. The pillar which is uh, most uh, relevant to femtosecond uh, applications, uh, ultra short pulses, is the um, um, at the second lines uh, being built in Hungary. Uh, that's the building which is being constructed right away and is practically st uh, stuffed with uh, OPCPA uh, technology. So those are also the biggest uh, uh, job markets, if you wish. So. Uh, uh, just to advertise the job opportunities, some of you might be interested in uh, looking at them. So three more slides and then I'll uh, start talking business. Uh, so uh, Paul Corkum yesterday um, referred to the 100 years of uh, an X-ray science, which uh, started uh, more or less like that with uh, incoherent X-ray supercontinua. So nowadays we can go um, to the level of uh, several angstroms, and we have laser-like uh, sources. So uh, they have uh, spatial and uh, temporal coherence. So this is proven here in a uh, double-slit uh, uh, young interference uh, uh, experiment. Uh, so we're not making any advantage of the um, uh, time of the temporal structure, so just of the spatial uh, coherence. Uh, and unfortunately, with those coherent sources, we're still far away from being able to um, resolve intraatomic distances. So that will motivate me in the second part uh, uh, in, in tomorrow's lecture to explain what are the opportunities of getting there. So one uh, field which is uh, extremely interesting is uh, uh, femtosecond uh, filamentation, particularly in gases. Uh, so the trick here is that uh, um, if you go uh, particularly to longer wavelengths, you can fundamentally change the properties of those uh, filaments because they would uh, uh, be able to pass a high energy because they would deliver a uh, hotter plasma. Uh, that uh, in turn uh, triggers uh, uh, a lot of interest in plasma chemistry that, for instance, you cannot do with... Uh, uh, um, conventional lasers like uh, titanium sapphire. Um, so uh, uh, just to illustrate it by a very spectacular application, uh, the uh, uh, 
filament induced uh, air breakdown creates a plasma channel that can be used as a uh, uh, conductor, as a lightning rod. And you see that uh, after the filament, the uh, uh, breakdown is a straight line uh, uh, given by the laser. So this is uh, frequently uh, used, or at least there are um, practical demonstrations how to uh, uh, employ it for um, a lightning conductor. Uh, uh, last thing on the applications, uh, uh, terahertz generation is extremely interesting. This is uh, uh, nonlinear optics in its purest form. Uh, so the most uh, traditional way of doing that would be through optical rectification. So this is a uh, free wave uh, mixing. Uh, there are more macabre uh, uh, techniques uh, using plasma as an oscillator. Um, and uh, in this case, it's a uh, rather complex way of uh, four-wave mixing, which could also be explained in terms of uh, um, electric, oscillating electric currents, so partly what uh, uh, Paul Corcom was talking about, uh, the uh, oscillation uh, of the electric field, but it has to be made biased. And with very short pulses, you can do it uh, with a single color, not two colors uh, shown here, um, just by using a, a pulse uh, which is very close to a single cycle pulse. Um, so um, for that, of course, you need to have uh, multi-millijoule sources uh, close to a single cycle. And um, uh, 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 be able to generate uh, uh, plasma and gases. Okay, so the uh, pieces of technology that uh, I would be talking about uh, are uh, uh, lasers. Um, so this is an example uh, of a uh, mature uh, product, um, a solid state uh, ytterbium uh, doped laser. So its basic elements are uh, 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 femtosecond mode locked uh, oscillator uh, based on the same material, regenerative amplifier, and uh, since this is a short pulse amplifier, it has to have a uh, pulse stretching and uh, a pulse compression unit. So this is uh, hidden in this box. Uh, so this is dispersion control. So I also heavily rely on uh, um, material from uh, light conversion. So this is done on purpose uh, because I sort of want to promote a little bit uh, laser science in uh, in the country that I come from, uh, Lithuania, and it set up a very ambitious goal uh, to reach 2% uh, of the GDP of the country from laser industry. It's not that uh, it's, a, it's a huge GDP. It uh, simply means uh, that uh, uh, there are many laser companies and uh, uh, little other industry involved. OK, so uh, this is an example uh, of a one box solution nowadays uh, you can buy um, uh, similar lasers from at least uh, five or six uh, companies uh, when it comes to uh, millijoule energy uh, ytterbium uh, doped diet pumped uh, femtosecond lasers. And uh, I'm also going to talk about uh, OPAs. Uh, so it justifies the use of a light conversion slide even more because uh, the major manufacturers like uh, Spectrophysics and uh, uh, coherent, they all take uh, OEM kits uh, uh, built by light conversion, and that's what you find in their market products. So in here, I would like to um, emphasize the advantage of an OPA. Uh, the example here shows the tunability curves uh, for the 800 nanometer pumped OPA. So you see this is the degeneracy point, uh, 1.6 micron. Uh, so the pump wavelength is 800. So the signal and the idler are tuned here. And then you can do further mixing and further mixing. And uh, essentially, you can cover it from uh, vacuum UV um, to very far in the mid IR. And the problem is the energy. So for most of uh, spectroscopy applications, we are fine. Uh, but uh, if we want to start using them as uh, driver pulses, uh, there are problems. And uh, that sort of, uh, uh, those are the nitty gritties that uh, I would like to explain. Um, now, uh, uh, we're going to talk business now um, about the fundamentals. So the first uh, uh, slide, um, I was trying to uh, present 
uh, sort of uh, uh, several scales in the same graph, I think it will be useful for you uh, for further reference. So uh, um, it gives uh, uh, wavelengths, it gives optical frequency, wave numbers, and photon energies after Paul Corcom's lecture and considering putting atomic units uh, as, additional, as an additional scale. It also shows the pulse duration and the inverse pulse duration that uh, uh, denotes the approximate bandwidth that you would need to uh, uh, provide in order to uh, 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 make a pulse like that. And the last thing that it shows, it shows uh, uh, optical cycle. So uh, the optical cycle duration, of course, grows with uh, wavelengths. And uh, uh, when we give the pulse duration without uh, saying uh, what the uh, cycle duration was, it uh, uh, makes it a little bit irrelevant. So the number of optical cycles per pulse scales is lambda to delta lambda, delta lambda being the uh, bandwidth. So for instance, when we will talk about mid-infrared sources, uh, a 60 femtosecond pulse is already pretty short. When we talk about uh, 800 nanometers, it's uh, uh, nothing special. Okay, now system definitions. Um, uh, so on the left, uh, there's laser terminology. And on the right, there is a uh, OPA terminology. And uh, basically, uh, those are the same concepts that I just uh, called uh, slightly different names. And so the laser terminology uh, is an oscillator. Uh, for parametric terminology, that would be an uh, optical or parametric oscillator, or OPO. So uh, an OPO as a such requires a synchronous uh, uh, pump, so a synchronized laser oscillator uh, driving it. Now, um, there's a little bit of uh, uh, a discrepancy in the terminology. A few people are still referring to uh, OPGs uh, um, um, uh, in a sense which we use uh, only to OPAs. So the distinction that uh, uh, many people are trying to uh, impose or streamline uh, in, the, in the field is uh, to call uh, superluminescent uh, driven sources uh, 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 OPGs. So uh, a generator that starts from uh, quantum noise as an input. Uh, and this is actually the source of uh, amplified spontaneous emission. And uh, uh, they keep the uh, abbreviation of OPA to sources that have a well-defined uh, seed signal in the input. So in terms of the laser terminology, that would be a superluminescent source, and uh, that would be a, a master oscillator power amplifier. So I uh, suggest that uh, you stick to the terminology OPA. And um, so here I'm restricted in my ability to cover the field. I will only talk about three wave mixing, so uh, only uh, chi two based uh, media. And uh, the jewel of the whole collection is a uh, short, pulse, short pulse amplifier. So conceptually, they look extremely similar. It's a MOPA that has a pulse stretching device and a pulse uh, 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 compression device uh, uh, afterwards. Um, for a number of years, there was a, um, uh, many abbreviations that uh, circulated in the literature. Um, I think by now we're converging to call them uh, optical parametric short pulse amplifier. Uh, right, now, um, uh, what are the technology limits uh, for a uh, few cycle uh, pulse generation? When we talk about uh, laser amplification or uh, any kind of optical amplification, potentially we're dealing with the problem of uh, uh, gain narrowing. Uh, and uh, uh, that means that uh, even if we come in with a very broadband spectrum, we will lose some of it. So to be able to produce a very short few cycle or even uh, sub-cycle optical pulse in the end, we would need to broaden the spectrum. So here we can use a uh, nonlinear technique uh, like um, SPM-based uh, spectral broadening in a solid medium in a gas-filled uh, uh, capillary uh, to restore the spectrum. Or we could try uh, engineering a uh, broadband amplifier and uh, uh, 
polymeric amplifiers often uh, offer such a possibility. And uh, that will be a uh, substantial segment of uh, the lecture just to show what are the different ways of uh, engineering the uh, broadband uh, uh, phase matching. So, but uh, later you will see that even from the point of view of parametric amplifiers, in many cases it's better uh, to generate a narrower spectrum uh, and still look for uh, similar techniques. So this hybridization is uh, running uh, throughout the field. Um, now, this is uh, extremely verbose. Uh, so I'll just uh, uh, emphasize the key statements and uh, I hope to return uh, to that slide uh, uh, later. So uh, the key advantages uh, of uh, uh, parametric amplification is that we can have this bandwidth. Uh, we can uh, get rid of uh, heat deposition in the amplifier, which means that uh, we're res uh, resolving the problem of uh, uh, solving the uh, heat dissipation uh, to the laser. Um, so we're also free to engineer our own uh, uh, phase matching bandwidth, so we're not uh, uh, limited to the uh, fixed uh, wavelength uh, transition. Um, and uh, we can also use multiple pumps. Uh, we can use uh, uh, multiple wavelengths of the pump and so on. Uh, that will be part of uh, what I'm trying to cover here. And uh, a, another very interesting uh, point is uh, this direct phase control comes from a very simple uh, relationship between the frequencies and the phases in the OPA. And uh, also, uh, OPA technologies are very frequently considered as uh, ways to improve the pulse contrast. Um, so, uh, uh, particularly because they can um, purge the laser part from the ASC uh, background. Uh, now, of course, OPA technology has a long history. I don't know if that was referred to in the fundamentals. Uh, so the uh, regional idea and the terminology comes from uh, uh, LC and RC circuits as was proposed by Man Mandelstam back in the 30s. And if you look carefully at the dates, uh, we see here a 30 year cycle. So then the OPA was realized like uh, 1962. Then the main uh, jumps uh, in the OPA energy, they were in the beginning of the 90s, like 1992. And we're just about to get into the next cycle. We have all the technology components there. What we're still missing are reliable uh, pump uh, lasers and seed lasers. So, but we're on the verge of getting them. So I think there's a very clear 30-year uh, uh, development cycle, and there is nothing uh, particularly unusual about that. So there was a theory back in the 20th century that all industrial development has a 30-year cycle, slightly longer than one uh, uh, human generation. Okay, and uh, this is uh, watered down to almost a cartoon level because I expect uh, uh, it was all covered uh, in the previous lectures uh, during the week. So. Our reactance parameter, um, uh, if we compare it to the RCLC circuit, would be uh, the nonlinear polarization. So here we'll look at the second order nonlinear polarization. Um, so uh, in an OPA, we come in with two waves, the pump wave and the seed wave. So the idler is generated uh, uh, as an additional third way. Um, so uh, gains up to a million per pass are feasible. We can crank it up to make more than a million, but that would be detrimental because uh, we would uh, grow up the super fluorescence background that we don't want. So actually, uh, uh, modesty in amplification is the order of the day, and uh, as with any amplifier change, you need to build progressive amplifiers and saturate them. Um, so. The OPA process can be viewed as uh, uh, splitting one photon and sharing its energy between the signal and the idler photon. That uh, gives uh, the fundamental loss mechanism here because we're losing energy to the idler. And uh, we need to satisfy um, this uh, um, energy conservation law. So this is the photon energy and the momentum conservation law. So the momentum conservation prescribes uh, two possible uh, 
um, geometries. It could be collinear uh, or non-collinear. And the phase matching would be the, uh, that we bring the difference between uh, wave vector of the pump minus the wave vector of the signal in the idler to zero. So that's the delta k uh, that we want to push to zero to get the uh, uh, wide bandwidth. Okay, so uh, occasionally an OPA is called a laser without uh, inversion. So since we're not dealing with uh, real energy levels, so this is a virtual level, we have an instantaneous uh, interaction. Uh, so I already listed the benefits uh, that we have the freedom in choosing the uh, uh, frequency of the signal and the idler. Um, and uh, uh, in most cases, we can do without heat. Uh, so heat would be a problem, again, if one of the waves uh, uh, goes into the absorption band. And uh, uh, maybe it's unfair to say uh, that this is a uh, sort of detrimental property that uh, we have instantaneous interaction. In some cases, it helps us, but it cre creates the head, uh, the hell of a lot of a headache for us. Okay, and the lasers are notoriously bad. They have heat. We cannot really change the wavelengths, uh, but uh, they can store inversion, uh, the flip side of the heat problem. Now, this is, uh, I put the slide here to uh, make a link to the question that uh, uh, Paul Corcom asked back after receiving the question, what is the meaning for uh, gyro laser? Uh, so he mentioned that, that one needs to look at the compromise of uh, um, the penalty that you would uh, accept by frequency down conversion. So yes, people are interested in uh, pushing the sources toward the longer wavelengths for specific applications, but uh, uh, it's not a very efficient process. And we begin losing energy already on the quantum level, uh, which means that uh, uh, the energy of the pump is necessarily uh, lost uh, into the idler. So part of it goes into the signal, another part goes into the idler. And this is a very simple graph that shows what happens for different pump wavelengths uh, as you uh, tune the idler wavelengths. Yeah? So for instance, if we uh, pump it at a 800 nanometers and we want to get to four micron, uh, we'll be getting less than 20% in the very, very best case, um, and so on. So that uh, um, uh, provokes two statements, that it's actually uh, good uh, to choose uh, the pump wavelengths of the OPA close to the a signal wavelength of uh, the OPA if we're interested in that. So that uh, solves at least one problem. We can easily reach the seed wavelengths uh, by uh, uh, doing white light continuum generation. Uh, we can also do uh, immediate carry envelope stability uh, for the idler. But the problem is that the energy that goes into the idler uh, gets smaller. So that's an incessant compromise that uh, people need to consider uh, when they build sources. Okay, so um, uh, we can denote certain comfort zones. So uh, intrinsically for an OPA, we can tune the wavelengths, but uh, the efficiency will not be the same across the tuning range. And in the previous slide, I showed the argument uh, uh, why it's not the case. So there are more arguments. Uh, we need to look for comfortable uh, pump lasers so the most developed lasers would be uh, uh, titanium uh, sapphire uh, and uh, one micron systems, and of course they are harmonics. Um, we should also look for phase matching bandwidth, and uh, I will argue that uh, around the degeneracy point, we can open up the widest uh, phase matching bandwidth, so that's uh, what you need to generate uh, short pulses. There are also conditions of the so-called non-collinear phase matching where you also uh, open up a very broad bandwidth and that works extremely fine uh, in, in the visible. So when you use uh, uh, pump wavelengths uh, uh, which are either the third harmonic of uh, one micron laser, the second harmonic of the 
uh, 800 nanometer titanium sapphire lasers or the second harmonic uh, 515, 530 nanometers of, uh, again, one micron lasers. So this would be like the Goldilocks uh, zone for, uh, for the phase matching. So in other words, we can open up the wide phase matching uh, where non-collinear phase matching works well. It will not be the case for near infrared uh, uh, pumping because we'll lose the advantage of uh, uh, non-collinearity. We can no longer match uh, the group velocities of uh, the idler and the pump. Uh, that will be shown in the slides to come. Um, and uh, we can open up a very broad band um, around the degeneracy. So this is uh, shown here. Uh, we use one micron lasers and uh, uh, essentially produce uh, single uh, cycle pulses uh, immediately. What we can also do, uh, we can uh, uh, work far away from the degeneracy. And in this case, we go for more narrow band uh, uh, pulses, but then one wave will go into the near IR, another one can go um, into the mid-infrared. And here, the important point is the availability of materials. So uh, you will see it later when I show the transmission spectra of uh, the best crystals we have there. And it's also the uh, transmission of the atmosphere. So that argument will uh, come later. And now, uh, there's another sub-segment. Uh, people have been working on that actively for the past, for the past like four years. Um, uh, we and other groups are trying to develop uh, uh, pump lasers at uh, around two micron and above to make advantage of, uh, uh, to take advantage of uh, uh, ZGP uh, crystals and uh, a few more infrared crystals. Uh, uh, so with the promise of getting uh, millijoule energies uh, uh, in the mid air. Okay, so now what about the uh, broadband uh, phase matching? So once again, as a reminder, uh, we have two conditions to satisfy, energy conservation, momentum uh, conservation. And um, uh, I already said it in words, I'll try defending the statement uh, um, uh, with a simple formula. So uh, near the uh, degeneracy point, we can have a very uh, wide uh, bandwidth. That applies to type one OPA, where both the signal and the idler wave have the same polarization, and uh, therefore they have the same group velocities uh, uh, at the same frequency. Yeah? So, uh, for type two, the argument doesn't hold uh, because they have orthogonal polarizations, they have different uh, uh, dispersions. So in such a case of a degenerate uh, uh, OPA, uh, uh, the formula for uh, full width half maximum bandwidth uh, can be given already by second derivatives uh, of uh, group uh, velocities. Simply, they, since the group velocities are the same, they cancel each other, so you need to look at the second uh, derivatives. For a non-degenerate OPA, we need to include uh, uh, both group velocities. And here comes a very neat uh, trick that uh, uh, we can equalize the projections of the group velocities on the pump uh, wave vector by making the faster wave, usually that's the infrared uh, idler, uh, to run at an angle. So it's faster, so let it go slightly in a different direction so the projections will be synchronized. So that includes a, the so-called non-collinearity angle, and we would need to use a correction factor uh, given by the cosines of each uh, um, wave vector um, to the pump uh, wave vector. So this is called uh, uh, non-collinear uh, phase matching. Uh, the abbreviation is slightly confusing. Uh, it's written as NCPM. And if you go to catalogs of uh, laser crystal uh, and nonlinear crystal companies, frequently they denote NCPM as non-critical phase matching, which is something else. So just uh, if you come across this abbreviation, beware that uh, uh, people might be tricking you. Okay, so this is an extremely good uh, 
reference to read up about the effect of uh, uh, nonlinear phase matching. And uh, uh, those are the examples of uh, what it can do. Uh, so the first thing, uh, the animation here uh, shows uh, uh, one problem with the nonlinear phase matching. So we have the fixed direction of the pump wave vector and the fixed direction of the sieve wave vector. Um, and uh, the idler uh, gets fanned out. So this is an inconvenience uh, working with uh, uh, nonlinear phase matching. So you need to do something about uh, compensating the angular dispersion of the idler. And usually, uh, if you take a longer crystal and each point along the interaction is a point source for the um, idler, uh, idler generation, uh, it becomes quite impossible because you have a smeared, uh, longitudinally smeared source uh, of the way, wave. But uh, if you're only interested in the signal, that's fine. And uh, uh, people really uh, uh, made a huge business out of that. Okay, so since I started uh, uh, by mentioning the nonlinear phase matching, I want to uh, finish it. So this is the case of nonlinear phase matching uh, for uh, 530 nanometer pump applied to BBO. And you see that uh, for a certain uh, uh, direction, so the angle with respect to the optical axis of the uh, crystal, uh, we can really phase match uh, uh, a continuum. Um, so this continuum uh, uh, covers essentially um, all the bandwidths of titanium sapphire. Now, uh, the uh, real bandwidth would also depend on the crystal thickness. So of course, if we take a very thick crystal, it would uh, shrink. Um, um, so in other words, that would determine this, uh, uh, the thickness of this uh, uh, sausage-like uh, uh, line. If we talk about the collinear geometry, uh, so uh, even for uh, uh, BBO, uh, we can get a, a broadband uh, condition. So uh, BBO type one, you see that it, uh, it's the broadest uh, as expected uh, around the degeneracy point. So the degeneracy point would correspond to the fundamental frequency of the laser. Okay, so those are the practical examples. Uh, they're very frequently used in uh, several cycle uh, OPAs. Now, just a few uh, concepts about how the band, uh, phase matching bandwidth can be extended. So the first uh, concept is uh, uh, we can apply multiple uh, pump wavelengths and uh, tweak the angle between the seed. So we keep the seed uh, direction steady and we apply uh, different pump lambdas at different uh, angles. So uh, the schematic shows a uh, nonlinear crystal, and then the appearance of the cone, in this case, it's a, a superfluorescence uh, of the signal wave, the idler wave is not shown. And uh, uh, when we, uh, uh, the uh, amplification happens in this point. Uh, so when the amplification happens, uh, uh, under correct circumstances, the superfluorescence cone is extinguished and uh, uh, most of the energy flows uh, uh, in the desired direction. Okay, so what we do now, uh, we apply uh, a slightly tweaked wavelength. So lambda two has a slightly different angle and uh, uh, it's matched in such a way that uh, it still uh, corresponds to the same uh, direction of the uh, signal. So. Um, this is how it can be done in practice. So we need to introduce uh, angular dispersion of the pump, such that different uh, pump waves uh, hit the uh, crystal at different angles. And this has been extensively exploited. It didn't start with OPAs. It started with uh, uh, broadband uh, uh, second harmonic generation, and uh, the list would go on and on. Uh, people have done it with uh, prisms, grisms, uh, gratings, and whatever. The concept is the same. Um, sort of you try adapting yourself to the uh, phase matching angles uh, of the crystal. Now, this is a similar concept in reverse. Uh, you can also 
disperse the seed wave uh, to do exactly the same. Uh, but the problem with this dispersion would be uh, that uh, afterwards uh, you would need to compensate it uh, um, to get a, a single collimated beam. So this is a, a theoretical calculation shows uh, what happens uh, in the normal case. So this is a uh, non-dispersed uh, seed pump. It sort of intersects the phase meshing curve and cuts out a uh, narrow bandwidth here. And uh, if you disperse uh, uh, the uh, seed frequency, uh, then you can follow the uh, tuning curve of the crystal and you can cover a substantially wider spectral bandwidth. But as I said, the, the problem is uh, you would need to uh, run angular, uh, to install an ang angular dispersion element uh, after amplification. Um, so um, another very uh, beautiful concept is to use uh, multiple uh, uh, pumps. Um, so uh, the simplest implementation of that uh, is to use the same wavelengths at uh, slightly different uh, angles. So each interaction individually uh, covers up a certain uh, uh, phase matching bandwidth and. A, as they overlap, you can open up a wider bandwidth. So I think the first one who did it was uh, Tom Sosnowski. Um, do I have him here? Yeah, uh, I have him here. Uh, so he implemented it in a, a multi-stage LPA where he used the same crystal, but each time he went through the crystal, he went slightly at a different angle. So he sort of reused the crystal, he tweaked the angle, and it was called like um, angle uh, dithering. Um, so later, people have uh, done uh, multiple simultaneous uh, pumps. Uh, so I'm listing all those papers in case you want to take a look at how the concepts were uh, realized. And uh, um, they also took advantage of uh, multicolor pumping in the sense that uh, uh, they pumped it uh, uh, with uh, 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 different uh, colors. Some, in some cases, it could be the second and the third harmonic of uh, a one micron uh, laser. Um, I just want to give uh, one word of uh, warning here uh, to people who maybe understand this topic slightly better. Um, so when you start applying the multiple uh, pump beams uh, at the same time, uh, so the simple phase relationship that I will be showing uh, later so the phase of the uh, pump equals the uh, sum of the uh, phase of the signal and the idler plus uh, some offset. So this will no longer be valid because you have two competing interactions going on at the same time. And that small constant, which will be pi over two in the case of a pure uh, free wave mixing, uh, it has to be revisited because it comes from the uh, sort of uh, a generalized phase of the uh, parametric interaction. So if you're interested in learning more about that, I can give you a, a reference where you can uh, read up on that. It's just a word of warning. So when we deal with the pure free wave interaction is different from when we start using multiple pumps at the same time. So another problem with multiple uh, pumps, especially at the same frequency, is that uh, you would call the, you, you would, uh, have the so-called Moir effect. Uh, uh, you would have uh, uh, longitudinal uh, interference of the beams, so pretty much along the lines what uh, uh, Paul Corcombe was showing uh, yesterday. And uh, uh, for a long time, that uh, remains an unsolved problem, so there is a way around it. Okay, so now um, what I want to say here is that um, there are ways of uh, 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 combining uh, the pump beams, and uh, uh, this could be done for multiple purposes. One purpose, as we saw on the slide before, you can do it for the enhancement of the bandwidth. So you sort of, uh, uh, you stay with the same crystal, the crystal is quite thick, it supports a relatively narrow bandwidth, but because you are using a distributed pump, you can open up several windows of uh, phase matching at the same time, and that covers a broadband spectrum. 
And the second reason why you could do uh, multiple beam pumping at the same color is that uh, uh, you want to combine the pump source from uh, several lasers. And uh, here uh, we make use of uh, the very nice uh, property that for each pump beam, uh, we can have an individual interaction. So we have a, the phase of the seed pulse uh, determined by the seeder. It's not influenced by the pump. And uh, each of, the, of those individual interactions will produce its independent idler, and that idler will uh, take on uh, sort of the phase junk. And uh, when this first appeared in uh, 1998, so it was, uh, uh, it was in relation to me, so that was uh, the paper by uh, Aldous Dubietis, and uh, it was presented by uh, Professor Piskarskas. Nobody noticed the paper, but uh, it actually, it, it opened up the whole field. Uh, people are still trying to, to do uh, multi-beam uh, multi pumping. So uh, the, the main reason, as I said, it holds the promise of combining several uh, laser sources. So you don't need to try very hard uh, to build a um, high energy laser. But the problem is that you would, would have the interference uh, of the beams. And, um, uh, uh, okay, sorry, I, uh, a bit of tautology here. Um, so, so that would be the, uh, the vision, what people want to have, uh, uh, that uh, they come in with multiple beams and the multiple beams uh, sort of uh, take a magic object and they continue on uh, as a single beam, as was in the Star Wars uh, movie. And uh, that wasn't quite possible for short pulses because uh, they would interfere and uh, uh, they would spoil the uh, interaction. So uh, quite recently, uh, people suggested a very smart way around that. Uh, they say, okay, we probably cannot combine the fundamental frequency beams, but uh, we can try combining second harmonic beams using a non-collinear uh, some frequency generation. So in the, this case, the phase matching determines that uh, most of the energy will travel uh, uh, between the uh, pump waves, and uh, the interaction is not really phase matched in the collinear direction. So this is really very beautiful, and uh, this is actively pursued in many lasers, including those big lasers that like the uh, ELI ALPS, uh, uh, one of the systems that I uh, refer to. So I think this is a beautiful solution to the problem. Unfortunately, it doesn't help you build lasers in the infrared because by frequency doubling, you actually go uh, further toward the visible instead of uh, going to the infrared. Um, and um, I want to continue on the same note of uh, uh, this phase property that um, uh, the uh, phase of the uh, pump uh, is, uh, has no immediate effect on the phase of the uh, signal, so, and it's absorbed by the idler. Um, so this is this relationship which I already um, uh, referred to, that the phase behaves pretty much the same wave, way as the optical frequency does. Yeah? So that the phase of the idler uh, will be the uh, phase difference between the pump and the signal, um, plus this constant, which I warned you about. Um, now, how else can we use it? Uh, the first thing is uh, uh, we notice that uh, uh, this can be used for chirp reversal in, in an OPA. Uh, for the first time, it was noticed uh, uh, nearly 30 years ago uh, again, by the group of Piskarskas, and they claim that uh, more or less they came across this accidentally. They just uh, um, asked themselves a question, what would happen if you amplify a, a chirp pulse? Um, and they thought the phase would be scrambled, and then they saw that, uh, uh, actually, no, this chirp pulse amplification works fine, but then they produced the idler wave that has a mirrored uh, uh, direction of the chirp, and this is, uh, uh, captured here in a strict uh, camera experiment. So by the different uh, mirrored slant of, of the streak images, you see that uh, the sign of the chirp is reversed. 
And uh, this has a uh, direct uh, uh, relation to the whole field of uh, uh, optical phase conjugation. It's, it's, an, uh, so it, it's a paradigm in it, uh, on its own, but uh, uh, it uh, offers a very cute way of solving uh, dispersion problems because the uh, dispersion that you accumulated during the propagation of uh, one wave, uh, so here's the complex amplitude, uh, can be unwound through the back propagation of the conjugated wave. And uh, as a phase conjugator, you can use a four-wave mixing or a three-wave mixing process. So this is a nice cartoon to illustrate the concept where Alice uh, sees uh, the back of herself in the famous mirror or uh, the pulse that uh, goes in through the dispersive uh, system can travel back and uh, recontrast itself. So this is how it's done in reality. So there are uh, OPAs that uh, run very near degeneracy where the two waves are uh, practically identical in, in wavelengths, and you can pass it through the same block of material to chirp, amplify, and unchirp. So once you start using very different wavelengths for the signal and the idler, that concept wouldn't work. And actually, it's also very actively pursued in the telecom research, as far as I know. And there are experiments where there are hundreds of uh, uh, kilometers of uh, uh, the optical fiber uh, uh, to reach the midway point, return back, and the pulse is really compressed. Okay, so, uh, so that's another implication of this uh, very simple uh, relationship. And uh, uh, one more is the way to isolate the signal wave, if we're interested in the amplified uh, signal pulse, from the uh, imperfections of the uh, uh, spatial phase of the pump. Because once again, the junk will be uh, carried away by the idler. I deliberately drew it as a nonlinear uh, uh, configuration. Um, so uh, another very important uh, aspect is uh, uh, we can use uh, uh, the same phase relationship uh, for uh, carry envelope phase uh, stabilization. I hope that everybody's comfortable with the concept. Uh, uh, so carry envelope phase is the uh, slippage of the carrier uh, frequency under the envelope. It becomes relevant to very short pulses where the envelope is on the order of uh, several optical cycles or shorter. And it also becomes relevant when you start combining multiple uh, frequencies because then uh, you're no longer talking about the relative frequency. You need to fix, uh, sorry, relative phase. You need to fix the phase of one of the waves and use it as a reference uh, to have a stable interference. So um, what this concept uh, uh, attempts to do um, is uh, 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 to derive the phase of the seed uh, uh, from the pump. So that only works in the so-called uh, white light uh, generating OPAs, where you use a supercontinuum as a source of the seed wave. So in a way, this is an SPM interaction of the uh, pump pulse, which broadens its spectrum. And of course, it stays coherent uh, across the spectrum. So one can argue very easily in terms of uh, four-wave mixing. This is a uh, sort of um, uh, nonlinear polarization, uh, third order, uh, where you have uh, chi three uh, times the electric field times the electric field times the electric field conjugate. And therefore, uh, you just retain the regional uh, uh, phase of the electric field, uh, sort of you continue, you produce a spectral wing of the pump and then use it as a seed. So under such conditions, uh, the pump and the seed, they carry the same uh, phase and uh, the idler uh, would have a constant phase. So that directly follows from that uh, small uh, um, equality that I was showing on two slides before. And uh, we can uh, sort of structure our white light seeded OPAs as uh, uh, phase stabilizing OPAs. Uh, so these two schemes are identical. The only difference is that uh, uh, here we might uh, frequency double uh, first before generating the uh, white light. 
um, in any case, we get a stable idler, a phase stable idler, or uh, we can uh, use the same relationship and now frequency double the pump uh, and do direct uh, uh, generation of the white light from the fundamental wave. And in this case, uh, we get uh, all phases of the fundamental of the idler and of the signal uh, oscillate in sync. So that would be a phase repeat in LPA. It would not be uh, locked in terms of, of the CPA, uh, CEP, but uh, um, all of them would uh, uh, provide a phase coherent waveform. So both options are very interesting. Um, and uh, this is a small recap. Um, so all four subjects that I referred to, <coughs> uh, they're supported by this uh, phase relationship. So I was talking about the possibility to combine pump beams, uh, the possibility of doing dispersion control through uh, chirp reversal. I will show an example of that on our bigger OPCPA system where we stretch uh, one wave uh, and after amplification we retain the other wave and uh, we unsharp it uh, using the same arrangement as we used uh, uh, in the stretcher. Um, so with the same dispersion sign. Um, so uh, we can isolate the signal from uh, spatial distortions of the, uh, uh, spatial phase distortions of the pump. Unfortunately, we cannot do it uh, for the spatial profile of the pump. And we can either stabilize the carrier envelope phase or we can do coherent uh, wave synthesis. And actually, we can also combine the two uh, and then we have both at the same time. But uh, to do that, we would need a CEP stable uh, amplifier laser. Okay, now uh, this is the uh, most uh, uh, interesting and critical part of what I want to uh, present uh, today. Um, I want to uh, sort of uh, give you a glimpse into the difference uh, uh, between femtosecond uh, uh, pumping by femtosecond pulses and pumping by picosecond pulses. And that would really help us to understand uh, some of the problems occurring in the uh, OPCPA uh, technology. So before we start, uh, very roughly, the, uh, the message is as follows. Uh, when we have femtosecond pulses, uh, they run through each other very quickly. Uh, so we will need to uh, take into account this uh, transient interaction of uh, moving uh, wave packets. So when we talk about picosecond pulses, we can already pretty much disregard um, uh, this uh, sort of sliding of the envelopes under each other in time. And uh, we get more or less quasi-static conditions. So, and this also has a very nice link uh, to the attempts to do adiabatic uh, passage uh, of, uh, uh, or in a uh, parametric uh, um, amplification. And I believe that uh, uh, Tuesday afternoon there will be a lecture on that, so actually I hope to catch it. But uh, what we will deal with here is uh, extremely simple. Uh, uh, colloquially, it's known the three sisters. So it's the three waves uh, that don't like each other, they just run through each other. And um, I apologize for using equations, but I hope they're quite easy to swallow in that form. Uh, so uh, we start off by uh, coupled uh, nonlinear equations. Uh, those are, um, again, um, complex amplitudes of the electric field. So the oscillatory part is uh, uh, stuck here in the exponent. Uh, so uh, I hope everybody knows how the system of uh, truncated or coupled equations is done. You can start off uh, from the Schrodinger, nonlinear Schrodinger equation, and then group terms uh, by the frequency, and then you would uh, get uh, individual equations for the uh, signal uh, uh, idler and the pump. And uh, it only works uh, when you have distinctly separated spectral bands. So once they start overlapping, you can no longer produce a um, sort of coupled equations, you need to retain one single equation. Okay, so as I said, the oscillatory terms are stuck uh, here in the uh, K vectors, and we just simply use um, the um, phase mismatch to, to deal with that. 
Uh, so those are nonlinear coupling coefficients, and uh, uh, I hope everybody knows the uh, solution of uh, uh, this um, system of equations that would produce a uh, uh, hyperbolic secant and cosecant for uh, the signal in the idler waves. Now we'll need to uh, tweak the system a little bit to uh, include the uh, group velocity dispersion. And uh, uh, so now we're in the, uh, looking at moving pulses. And uh, we can simplify it uh, a little bit by switching to the um, frame of reference uh, associated with the pump pulse. So we've done that. So now we have differential terms here and uh, uh, we're sort of pegged on the pump pulse. And further, I'm gonna show the results of numerics for uh, multiple cases. So I'm not sure how this will be video graphed. Um, so I really need your feedback here because the movies run kind of fast and probably I would need to rerun each one of them uh, several times. So uh, 